Uh, how's it going, everybody? Uh, my name's Shane Hart. I'm the CEO of Computers Inc. Okay, we are at the booth with Utilicate. You'll see Utilicate out there, but uh, I'm essentially I'm CEO of a software firm. Okay, and and some of the stuff we're going to talk about is the mindset for you know adopting technologies. Um, and leveraging those to speed up some locates and how the different things come in. Just a little bit of background about myself. Um, you know, it's always important to be hard work and to work smart. So myself, um, I grew up playing hockey. I played a year of pro hockey and played university hockey. But I was also the guy, you know, with my older brother buying like a $1,200 CD burner back in the day and using Napster and making CDs, you know, uh, because, hey, you know, you had the Columbia, I don't know if everyone remembers, it was one cent for 12. They couldn't go low enough to make it, you know, more beneficial than, hey, if I put all the songs I want on one CD, right? Obviously, that's better. Um, so those two things as my background, okay, helped me to become good at the position I'm in today. Um, and what happens is you learn how to work hard, which is always important, but then also working smart. And it's really those two things together that uh, allow you to really push your, your business and what you do or what your day is up to two different levels, okay? Um, one other thing, is any from, anyone familiar with the CGA tech paper? Anyone ever read the tech paper? Is anyone aware that there's a technology committee with the CGA? Yes. Yeah, okay. And, and part of my talk, I'm gonna be referencing that throughout this presentation and, and talking about that, and you know, it's something that's so important to the industry um, to put that education out there and almost have what's called, you know, your finger on the pulse, all right? What's going on out there? As a tech firm, you know, we spend a lot of time watching like Amazon releases and new stuff with the cloud infrastructure that's out there. These guys are adding, they're almost like a competitor of yours. Like, when is Amazon just gonna start doing locates and so forth, right? So you keep your finger on the pulse of this, it takes a lot of energy and effort, and that CGA white paper is, is a good spot for you to maybe look at it and see what kind of things are coming down and how those kind of affect you. As, um, you know, in everyone's job, it's kind of like an evolving cost-benefit analysis. And you might not use all of these things right now, but you need to kind of be aware of them as they maybe get further up their technology and how acceptable it is. Uh, maybe if there's changes and as things improve, you know, especially like those GPS receivers, right? It used to be like a big thing like this and you used to have an antenna with a backpack and now they just fit in the wands and they got a second one somewhere off site, you know? So um, always keeping that, you know, that's what we're gonna talk about today is how to keep that finger on that pulse and the things that we do in house to, to help us be successful, All right? Because tech is moving fast, the current state of the industry I know this is the Global Excavation um, Conference, but it could almost be the software conference as well. As you see out there, there's lots of different vendors that deal in software, um, ticket management systems, and most companies here, whether you're just an excavator, you're touching data, you might have your own stuff in-house, and there's always a big collection of different programs. So it's when you get down to the nitty gritty of the different feature sets, and what's happening, and how do we get there, and how do we make great decisions about all that technology. There's a flood of information, and like I mentioned, that CGA white paper can help you out. Okay, I think I just clicked a lot of here. So you want me to stand up here? So it's gonna be pretty informal, okay? We got a, a pretty quiet room in here as well. So like, we're gonna ask a couple questions in there. Maybe there's some technologies near the end of it that we wanna kind of just put some perspective on and see, um, and kind of assess those, all right? So just an overview for some of the things we're gonna talk about today in my presentation here. We're gonna talk about tracking damages with GIS. I actually wrote an, an article for the DP Pro that has the same title. And it's listed eight things in there, and that's eight of many, okay? There's so many different parts from a locator's day to a high-level executive and everything in between, all right? So the ones that I wrote about in the article is collecting the mapping as you go, and there's lots of stuff out there. I think there's another presentation going on right now, and. And there's lots of tools. GPS has been around since a long, long time. It's not just, hey, it came out yesterday, and wow, let's all get it, right? Same as the stylus. Anyone know, like, the mouse? The mouse and computer is an amazing invention. Very minor movements to move your cursor everywhere, right? 
I've seen a guy do a whole clearing system for the city of Toronto, and he's like, I just, I got a mouse with all these buttons, and he had all these quick shortcuts. It was a pretty amazing tool that, that he had there, and the stylus has been around since the 70s as well. But the mouse still beats it, okay? And anyone, like the fingers on the phone, I just switched to an Apple phone, I'm having trouble, I think my finger might be too fat for the Apple phone. All right, sometimes that's in there. But the mouse and all these technologies, they've been around a long time, and how do we adopt them and bring them in and, and use them, and how do we know when they're ready? Um, so mapping's a big one, all right? Automating dispatch functions, this is classic ticket management stuff. If the more data you have, the better decisions you can make. If I have dispatchers holding on to tickets or anything like that, that's, you know, 101, that locator is gonna be driving past some locators. All right, expanding those TMS functions. So yeah, there's the basic stuff and the stuff we have to do, but what are those advanced things that ticket management systems are doing now to even speed up that even more so? All right, triaging tickets, you know, that's just one expanded TMS function that's very popular. How do we do risk analysis? All right, I can't even do all these. Tell me the ones that I need to be focusing on. All right, and there's a lot of systems that do that. Um, syncing with utilities GIS systems, right? Another thing of data. We're gonna talk a lot about data, speed. The more you can get that information organized, the more information, uh, the better performance you're gonna do. All right, locator tracking. Uh, we're gonna talk about that. And then automating routing is something we've done. It's, you know, a lot of these words are pretty vague. Like if I say AI, for example, there's a lot of different ways of AI. If I say routing, there's a lot. There's ticket routing, locator routing. And so some of this is just to get you in the mindset of how to, you know, critically think about all this stuff that's out here and, and what's best for you and keeping your current businesses, cost benefit analysis always an evolving and growing, growing assessment, okay? Clickers back here. All right. So first off, tracking damages with GIS. We all have the dirt report, right? Where everyone's aware of the dirt report, right? If you're not, you're already behind. Okay. Dirt.commongroundalliance.com. You can go in there, and right now you'll see that the dirt report for 2021 is there. So how the dirt report works? They look at the year. Okay. And then they take that year, they do an assessments, and they release, I believe, around April time to look at a see, big secret. Uh, Hypervac's really good, right? It tells that every year. But there's other stories in there, um, of, in that, you know, in the dirt report that you can use for yourself. Um, so one of the things that's a little bit interesting here with damages is as we get into more mapping, really mapping is like taking 3D and adding something to it to make it 4D. It's like adding smelling to the ride at Disney or something, you know? Like, hey, that was just way different. I got a different picture, I had a different experience. Same as when you're adding mapping. And one of the big things that we think is tracking these utility strikes into your GIS system as its own layer. Damages happen. We're all on the road to zero damages. And, you know, there's certain ways to get there. We're not gonna get there to zero. We're gonna get close to it. It's like an asymptotic kind of graph. But if one thing we wanna make sure we never do is make the same mistake twice, okay? It's okay to have a damage and do everything, those are gonna happen, but if you have the same damage in the same area and it was a mapping thing that's need to be fixed four times, that's where we get into problems. So tracking your damages, it's like adding a 40 element to your dirt report so that when I have a ticket come in now, I can almost add a piece to that ticket to say, there's a previous damage in this dig site. Don't make it again, kind of thing, right? And so adding these damages to your GIS, it can be a separate layer you're gonna get increased efficiencies, and really this is what drives a lot of AI machine learning, okay? So how AI works, you need a target, okay? And you build these models in here, and the model just says, what do I change in this big whole model that makes that target come down or up, all right? So you could have an AI that could increase damages as well, you know, and it would do things, but you wanna have as much data in there so it can look at that target and how do I do that to get to zero? And when AI, you know, it's a bit of a buzzword, but it just means constantly evolving, constantly evolving uh, kind of choices, all right? So one thing it might say today, hey, that's a potential risk for damage. Down the road, it might say uh, two months, two years from now, it says that's not, right? Because it's constantly evolving, all right? Uh, one interesting thing that we have um, in, um, the province of Ontario is mandatory damage reporting, 
for the top 20% uh, of the notification receivers, so the utilities. Um, and it's interesting right now, they just passed fines and so forth. I was on a Planet Underground rent round table in Texas, I believe that was October. We talked about how do we get all this mapping into one spot, essentially. And these are some of the things they talk about. Do call centers kind of manage that and head in front of that and be the kind of centralized spot? Um, and there's a lot of concerns with it, but we're starting to see some tracks in some different place. Am I centralized for damages or am I centralized for mapping and so forth? So just some things to be aware in the industry, all right? And mapping your damages can be a big help. Okay. And when we talk about mapping, you know, an obvious segue right in is to collecting mapping as you go. Okay, you're gonna see there's quite a few products out there that collect the mapping. Even me as a ticket management um, software, I have to look at how many people are competing at that problem, right? Technology is just like, I have a problem, I'm just trying to solve it, right? And what are the different ways that we can do that? So when it comes to collecting mapping as you go, you have a few different, the Esri Collector app is a really good app too, to use. Um, when you're out there in the field, because if you're out there collecting that data, you can leverage that for future locates that come in. There's the Esri Collector app, um, there's a utility mapper, I think there's GPR mapping collection, there's Geolantis, all kinds of different stuff. And sometimes it's overwhelming, right? Uh, I'm sure you hear sometimes software companies, we do it all, but every software company, we ain't Google over here. We still have limited resources and time. Sometimes it takes time to make that awesome feature that we want, okay? So like any company, you're a collection of your systems, right? And as those systems, they need to be able to work together, and we'll get into some more details on that, okay? Every time I ask a company about, you know, how good you're mapping, I get similar answers. Ne never quantitative, it's always qualitative answers where it's pretty good, or it could use some work, or out of, I never get out of a thousand locates, we had a map correction on 200 of them. Right? And so that's where something here, when you're collecting your map and as you go, even recording how many times you have to update your map or how many times that um, you sent it into the mapping company, like in our program, if I identify a map correction and I do some mapping, either have the app of what the map is and it goes right into the map or it sends an email, you redline, it goes right to the engineer so that they know about those things because locating is an expense side of the account savings, okay? Expense side, and the more you can add value added that helps out stuff on here, like mapping as you go, uh, will give you more resources, more benefits. I find a lot of cities, you know, even if they outsource locates, they want to keep that skill in house, at least on one or, one or two people for sure, right? They might do surveying, um, all kinds of stuff. And some of the GPS, there's one uh, utility mapper, even us, we've looked at um, because we have to kind of choose what we want to do. Uh, we can't do everything. Utility Mapper is one that we've worked with to kind of say, hey, you're really good at collecting. Trimble is really popular. You're good with Trimble. And we're going to do there to do a sketch tool in between from the mapping as well, right? Um, some places, every state's different. Sometimes sending a visual information along with your locate, as long as it doesn't take manual work on someone's behalf, can be a big benefit. All right. So this is going to be a popular theme of this conference as well. So make sure checking the different things out and how they kind of integrate it to your workflows. All right, this is the one I was talking about here. Pretty straightforward, right? Does anyone here handling locates with an email? Does everyone have kind of a ticket management system? Hey, email's pretty good. Not for managing locates, but it's pretty good technology, all right? And it's a specific technology. Anyone know what FTP means? It's a file transfer protocol. There's also VTP, which means Video transfer pro protocol. And what that means is when you're in software, it gets very specific to the functions that you're doing. Um, so when you are using email, email's built for chatting, conversations, sharing. There's not a lot of standards that come into email. So when someone tells you, hey, we received by email, it's gonna be like a 99.8% uh, of accuracy versus if you receive by FTP, where it gets more to like 99.9. .9. Kind of because just that little bit difference, you know, it's very hard to, to send out, you know, thousands, like tens and hundreds of thousands of emails and not say, hey, Microsoft come to you and say, hey, what's going on over here? It's really tough to kind of stay on top of those standards and, and so forth, all right? So 
when you have a ticket management system, right, you can have the tickets come in, all your data gets organized, um, whether it's emergencies, cancels, all this stuff, it's a lot of notifications coming in at one time. So if you don't have these basic functions, you know, you're already behind the eight ball, all right? Um, bypassing office staff is a big one. There might be some screening. Um, I know on some gas in some states, we have to go to everyone. But the more, if that locate sits at an office spot, that's more chance of the locator bypassing that or skipping by that when it's out there. You're trying to get these right down in the hand so people can now these there when they plan their day. All right, so one of the things our system does, you draw every little polygon and, um, you know, and that's a locator's area and then it comes down and it goes right in that area. Same for emergencies, right? We try a few things in there because, you know, everyone's got emergency alert procedures. We just try to be smart on uh, what we do. So our, alert, our emergency alert procedure looks at the area, it text messages that guy, but puts the emergency in a queue. So he still has to go and assign it to himself to say, hey, I've approved that I got it. And once he assigns it, the system kind of shuts off. But if he doesn't assign it and he gets that text, now the system, it also texts his lead hand, but now the system will alert the dispatch. Say, hey, this emergency is still unassigned, right? And using these basic dispatch flows, you're not someone to be like, hey, I've spent an hour chasing down someone and I don't even know where they are, right? You still might reference a geotab or so forth and find those things out, but you're adding things in place from the ticket management system to really speed some things up, all right? And then also, and we'll get into triaging here in a bit, uh, but tickets requiring stakeout, they just become available right away to that locator, right? If one comes in that day and he's right there, uh, he can look at that and get that done per day instead of that sitting somewhere for him to pick up in the morning. Right? Basic stuff in this PMS, all right? Now, expanding those functions, okay? Uh, one of the things that when we came into the U.S. and we found was pretty beneficial. We started sending emails on every locate that was completed uh, automatically and sending a form with it as well that had a big description of all the work uh, that was done and the status to the current locate as well as sending it to the call center. What we found was excavators weren't running to the call center to go check things out right away. Like you'd have to check that every five minutes. It's always better to be notified than to go and have to check something. You know, that's not, that's a simple logic, uh, logic, and you know, that's always better. So we were finding that we would alert the excavator and they'd call in. They'd be like, what is, what is this I just received? What's all this information? And we found that a chance to educate, a chance to talk to them about what's on there, and then we found a behavior change. So the excavators, and this was in Indiana, there was a lot of damages we were getting for the center point contract with my client there, and by doing this, we found a bit of change in the behaviors of the excavators that they would wait for that notification to come in before they had a crew to send out there. It wasn't so much about the two days and they're like, we're going. It was a little bit of a smarter decision to be like, do we have all our stuff yet? I haven't got the notification. So just a very simple thing about adding an extra email created a little bit of behavior change. And if anyone was looking for that one be all thing that solves all your problems, they don't exist, right? Everything's a collection of the, the features in the systems that you have in place, right? So that's just one. Ticket overflow, um, you guys might find this with the call centers. Every time I wanna update maps or do some changes in there or make a new utility code or member code, that takes time. There might be a day of movement in there. Not every call center is gonna get back to you as timely as you want as well, right? So um, inside your TMS, you can have one code come in and you can draw areas to have this area over here is to a, what's called an overflow. This is gonna be done by a, a locate company and maybe we keep all the internal resources right here over the downtown area, okay? And that's an expanded TMS function. Now you can have your ticket management to kind of toggle those floodgates for how your locates go, all right? And then obviously cutting down an office work and we'll get into triaging, but there can be alerts that are built right in there. So if we get something and it hits the GIS system, you know, and it's high profile, tell the excavator early on. He'll, he'll prepare a little bit differently for that, you know, high profile stuff in the area. Um, so there's lots of different TMS functions. We do texting, I'll talk some more about those. But this is a big one. This is a big expanded ticket management function, okay? This is triaging tickets. 
very popular. Um, and what it is, is not all locates are the same. All right, we all have slogans, we all have buzzwords, all that marketing jazz. You probably hear, you know, 40% uh, of the diggings or damages come from 5% of the tickets. And that's obvious, you know, if you're not already thinking that with your workflow and the stuff that you get, you're out of your mind. You know, um, some digs, whether it's a flower bed, is not gonna come over and, you know, damage some big mains on some of those versus if I have a big sewer repair project, okay? So as these projects comes in, um, you know, one way our ticket management system handles it is we build rules. So I can say a type of work with the depth and use that as one clearance rule, essentially. Um, some call centers might have a one and it's a sequential thing where it goes, is it private property, yes or no, they go. Is it depth, meet this, yes or no, and then they'll check the type of work. So it's not necessarily taking those data fields and combining them into a rule, it's doing them sequentially. And that has a big difference on what your clearance intelligence is. All right. So triage ticket, the big one, is looking at those low risk, high risk, um, and being able to assign those risk levels automatically. Okay. Um, so for us, we, we connect to the mapping um, using a REST API. API, just for everyone, means Application Programming Interface. Okay, it's just how, even for our own, these software companies out here, sometimes we have APIs we use in-house because the databases can be pretty complex. Most of these systems are quite old, right? And they've been, it's like all the betting apps you see, and you think hey, they just sprung up. Well, they've been around for 25 years. They just finally got the marketing opportunity to make a thousand commercials. Um, so when you look at these, one of the big things for risk assessment is being able to connect to your Esri system or your GIS system in real time. So if you have high profile infrastructure, all those attributes to the um, utilities you have, when that ticket's received, it can take that dig area, compare it to your data set, uh, what you have in your GIS, and identify what size of that main is it there. You know, and then put a tag on the ticket as something, maybe it's high profile, and now you're gonna treat that one differently, right? But as that ticket comes in, what you have at the call center is more polygon based, and your GIS system will have more detailed data. So sometimes it's worth that additional screen through your GIS data to grab some high profile information or suggested clears, um, some additional pieces of that data like we talked about, 4D versus 3D, and then take that and use that to assign the risk levels for your, your locates, all right? And then that way you can prioritize tickets based on risk. If you have someone, you know, that disappears for a day or anything like that, and you want to, you can't get them all done, you know, you can prioritize the most dangerous ones, all right? The thing about this too, um, this is really big on the uh, AI learning, right? Once you track your damages and your, your risks in the same area, now as locates come in, it can say, hey, which one of these and constantly evolve that model. Um, reallocating locates to experienced locators, right? So if you do have locators and I do some work operations management, I say, I gotta make sure Dave has tickets and Joe has tickets. Well, if you have some systems, CMS, to kind of automate their areas, now you can come in and make more critical decisions. And that's what technology really helps you do. It says. Let me organize the data, let me tell you what you should do, and then when the decisions you do spend in have higher impact. So that's sometimes where you can say, hey, you know, I have experienced locators, I'm sure we're all looking for different locators, see lots of job ads all the time, but the guys that are freshly hired just coming in the industry are not the same as the guy that's seasoned, right? And this can be something there that using ticket triaging and being able to assess the stuff can really help out on how you uh, locate, how you assign those locates or give them out. And when I talk about the uh, APIs, there's something called a REST API. So a REST API is just two computers talking to each other over the internet. That's all that means, okay? So when you say one's kind of just hanging out and this one says, hey, I need an event, it goes over, it calls, that one does something. And there's lots of different APIs. And maybe one day the call centers, they're getting more and more where they're gonna have APIs at the call center where we can push back data. If we go out and we map a locate, 
And we collect it in there, we update our mapping system. At some point in the future, that mapping system is gonna go straight up to the one call system as well to update that and say, hey, we've added some infrastructure. And same as the clearances, where if I give a clear over here and it's all clear geographical, that can someone go up to and that would all work out through an API. So one project we did with uh, on the spot utility resources and center point energy. Okay, they were getting uh, manual maps. They'd update them once a month. And we had this, you know, a locate company and they were a locate company. They weren't a mapping company. They weren't an IT company. This was a private locator that started this company and he just cared a lot about keeping people safe out there. All right, so they knew that they weren't a tech company and they weren't gonna turn into a mapping company and solve all these problems. And so for them to manually update CenterPoint energy mapping and make sure everyone has the proper viewers and keep local versions on that, we scrapped all that and went with connecting directly to the utilities REST API for their GIS information, all right? It was interesting too because we go from Indiana and we kept growing the company, I think they're out almost 200 locators now. They're up in Minnesota doing some center point. You go up to Minnesota, a little different from Indiana, and you go up to Minnesota and you have the locators and you, you set up this new system. And there's gonna be pros and cons of it too, right? Where maybe someone has, the first day they try it, they're in a really tough internet you know, connectivities area and the maps might be not loading that great. So right away they get a bad taste in their mouth, right? Hey, all this is not working. Let's go back to the old way that we used to do it. It's always a common phrase, all right? But then as they got used to it, they really, really liked it. And the company itself, Centerpoint, in other states was wondering how we got this. And so even in, within its own company, there can be fragmentation, different departments, um, you know, not all companies are the same, but the benefits of having that map data be updated in real time for the locator was very important. So that's when he talked to the utility representative, they're looking at the same map. There hasn't been any changes, not one stale. The things that I see here are the things that are here. We're looking at the same map. Um, as well as we reduced all that manual data pushing. And then we could even connect to it and query it for as locates were coming in to, to identify things such as high profile and so forth. All right. So this was one change that we made it didn't seem like that big a deal, but it made some very big improvements to the field users. And it was something that we there is, we know this is better. There might be some things along the way, but let's put it in there. Let's support it, be close by and see how it works out. And you know, it's been great. And it's something that they want to do in other areas as well. Okay. Locator tracking, you know, this one is never easy. Okay, like I said, we have all the wide ranges of locators out there. And, uh, you know, it's something we had, uh, we found out, you know, some of the best locators can be made from former police detectives, retired police detectives. Because when you go out there, it's like a puzzle. I had a, a company said our favorite interview question is, do you like puzzles to the guy uh, or girl? And so when you have these locators, you have a mix a uh, bag of high-end, tech-savvy, love it, and then also the bottom. I think right now anyone will take some locators that doesn't have, you know, bad damage history, for sure. Um, so some of this locator tracking, there's a wide range of tools that can be used in there. Everyone's half, get a picture of their screenshots. If you want to try some ticket managers, hey, let me try completing a ticket in your system and see how that feels. Um, so some of the stuff for locator tracking, uh, we do, we track the device uh, out in the field. So we know if a user is starting a ticket or not, and we just show a hard hat or a car based on what he's doing. Uh, we also pull in the information from their uh, GPS, like their car tracking. And that's one thing there too, uh, when companies talk about doing everything, one thing we're not doing is building the little diagnostic devices for your vehicle, okay? because it's a very unique software. A lot of companies I see, you're gonna have a payroll solution or, or accounting solution, you're gonna have some vehicle asset protection solution, and you're gonna have a TMS, all right? I don't see anyone out here in these uh, ticket management companies that's really promoting a vehicle tracker or anything like that. 
But for us, we're always looking at our roadmap, comparing it to what the industry provides, and we're gonna track the phone, and then we're gonna to start to track how far is that located from his vehicle, right? So when you start to get into these different little things, if he keeps walking 2,000, you know, uh, 2,000 yards away from his vehicle, um, that's pretty far, that's pretty far. And when we tracked this app, when we first started it, um, we just saw these guys walking back and forth to the vehicle a lot, whether they want to check their laptop for something or we don't know what. Uh, but so we started to move more functions to the phone. So for looking at your ESRI information or GIS, you had it on your phone, but when you need a big screen, you also had it on your laptop. And both of these systems were connecting up. So if I'm out here and I gotta call the excavator or change date, I'm doing it from my phone. But if I'm in my, you know, my vehicle, I can have a larger screen because screen real estate is a real thing. Like I talked about my fat finger, fat finger to phone ratio is pretty high. You know, mouse to computer screen is a big, is a lot uh, less of a ratio, and so a lot more ease of use. All right. Enhanced data flow, we have connectivity things that are out there for uh, the locators. Uh, but really there's some spots that are just really, really tough. So there's some offline things and so forth, but really tracking that locator, where he is, making sure those tickets get down to him, and then what he's doing for his day. Is he hiding out? Where are those GPS picks? Where are those GPS locations of the photos? A lot of this stuff is, um, can help you track and see what, what a locator is going on through, going uh, through in their days, all right? We do some routing stuff, I'll talk about it on the next slide as well, but the tool that your locators, I mean, it's like Uber, like no one calls the office for Uber to say, can I talk to the supervisor or anything like that? When it comes to your locators, getting the information out there, and they're really trying to make them their own damage prevention expert, everyone that's out there, all right, so that they, know the things that they have to do, um, they have their information, we know what they're doing. Um, an important thing for on the spot was to know as soon as you had a bad actor in your company. Right, as soon as you have a bad actor, his habits are contagious, um, he's having trouble in his area, and when you have owners that care a lot about safety and making the experience feel safe, you know, it's important to kind of trim those early on, trim those early on before they get too, uh, too much influence, all right? And so this is an interesting one with, you know, uh, the locators out there and the amount of tickets that you have. General routing, okay? It's an interesting piece. It's really expensive. To use Google Maps, you can do up to 23 points for free on um, Google Map API, all right? Once you get to more of those, um, it gets a lot more expensive. Like if you're a logistics company, or you're doing pure later and you got, you know, a hundred stops, they know where they're making their money for these Google route algorithms, okay? Anyone hear of the traveling salesman problem? Okay, if you're in, you know, computer, if you're in math or computer science, the traveling salesman problem is I'm going to a city to sell knives or whatever. And I'm going to that city and I have so many places I wanna hit. What's the shortest distance to hit all those places? And it's funny in that because for someone selling knives, they wanna go out of those places, right? So does a locator. A locating industry has a unique challenge. We're not an HVAC company or we're not an electrical company where we can schedule events and just go and meet the next one. I'm a little late, call the next guy, hey, I'll be late. Um, we have more work than any of us can handle. And that's where that triaging comes into place. And that's where this traveling salesman problem comes into place. It's a very, very tough problem. Okay, and for us, we looked at, we took a Google Maps API to do the routing, and what we did was, I have 100 tickets, so I can do, you know, 23 for free, and we compounded that together, and we kind of did a mathematical clustering algorithm to kind of say, find me the biggest, like, biggest concentrations of tickets, and let me hit those areas so I can get the most done from activity, and then you can kind of change it if you're starting to get behind and you want to change dates. All right, most locators will take half an hour of their time to an hour to plan their day tomorrow, right? And they're really good at it. I talked about the private detectives, you know, a locator, the best locators, they know all the theory. They have 20 years experience out there. They can be a detective, right? They can also handle all, they can plan their route very nicely. They've been in that area for a while. 
Um, so it's very hard to get those guys that are that good at that stuff. And so one of the things that we thought is, you know, saving time is a big deal. If I take half an hour to plan this, my routes for the day or an hour, and we can do it for you in seconds, then you'll have an extra half an hour to do a few more locates. Right? Seems pretty straightforward. All right? Um, the other things that we did when we were implementing this stuff is not all locators are the same. We made it so you could turn an individual on for routing or not. So you could say, hey, I have this guy on routing. Let me keep this in the wire. This guy on routing and this guy not because sometimes you get senior staff that's like, hey, I am this guy. I do know my area really, really good. And we didn't want to close doors on stuff. So when you're adopting technology and bringing things in place, first thing that we can see if someone's a good programmer or not, do they keep it so that they can revert back? Like if I'm changing files, I would write old on the one file and then make a new file, play around with it, and then I can always trace my steps back, okay? So when you're implementing something of routing or so forth, you know, make sure that when you're adding things, you can still backtrack and you have some flexibility on what it is. Don't dive in blindly anytime, all right? It's great for new recruits. If they're new to an area or routing's a powerful tool, um, it reduces stress and allows them to focus on locates. We talked about the tags, and for the tags, it's just another piece, another piece. As a routing is getting smarter, you can look at these tags, the same as your ticket triage is getting smarter. These are two systems working together. I'm not hiring a bunch of people to, to put this information together. And then also, when you're building things, even with all of us TMS, it's a close relationship. If you're a client of ours, we're gonna be talking to you about things. Um, and like we talked about, you know, how does an emergency affect this routing? The routing and stuff never changes. Everything is constantly evolving. We are always out here, similar to everyone else, looking at all the technologies that are out here. What do we want to do next? How do we implement? We're networking with each other. And that's the same things for everyone to do here with all your peers and all the different vendors. So I know I mentioned a few things, but just some of the things that we put in place. And a lot of these features, a lot of the ones, uh, a lot of the ticket management systems have similar things, okay? Uh, but what you wanna do is you wanna get into the nitty gritty details of them all. Um, so obviously, full one call center integration is an absolute must, right? Sometimes there's a lot of moving parts right now. I know with some connections we've done, we've had to get down to identifying things on the notification level versus just a ticket level because we're diving deeper on there. Hey, what I do for that cancel? What I do for the second notice? So forth, right? We talked about emergency notifications. So as soon as one comes in, it tells a guy in the area, hey, you got one to text him and text his, his lead hand, and then it waits in the office for half an hour. If it's after hours, it'll just text the locator who's on call, not the guy in the area. And these are things that, you know, save us someone in the office, you know? Um, Utility mapper, sketch, and locate. So we're constantly looking at five max ones with the GPS in them, the RDs, the GPR units. They all have different stuff in them, but they're all doing a similar thing. Like I talked about, really we talked about 3D to 4D. I have a database. Here's all my text information. When I add GIS, it's just another database that has shape relations in it as well. All right? So when you're doing utility mapper, sketch, and locate, all these things that these... It's not like they're creating a new kind of unique map. They're just collecting geographical data out there. There's a lot of things that come into play with it, but you want to be able to collect it, store it. And then for us, we want to look around there and be able to use that stuff. If we have more tickets coming in and we're able to collect stuff in real time. You can identify that stuff, whether it's a collector app, utility mapper. This is just, utility mapper is just one that we've kind of teamed up and started a partnership and exploration with um, as they continue to grow and they're a triple, triple provider. Um, text message notifications, uh, just a recent thing that happened to us, used to be email to text, where you could say that at AT&T, you could write the phone number in there, at att.com, and it would send an email, but it would go to someone's text, it would just text them on their phone, all right? When I talk about the email, similar to the standards, problems with that, right? Where maybe they're not getting through. So a lot of the cloud systems actually have text messaging systems, SMS, built into them now. So it's a powerful tool to be able to update someone in the field with a text, say they don't have internet connectivity, but they do have cellular. All right. Minimizing discrepancies between the utility and the locator we talked about, you know, with the REST API, GIS damage tracking, 
is another one there. Hey, just how can I use this 4D data of geographical to make my decisions smarter on this? What if I can't get to every locate? What ones am I choosing not to do? Uh, all right. Real-time collection of the maps. So if you're out there, lots of different mapping tools, you need to be having some GPS. QGIS is a free GIS framework um, that's pretty powerful, right? So if you ever get extra time to play around, that's a good tool to play around. Um, all right. High-profile pre-assessments, tagging, identifying stuff on the ticket. You know, you're gonna hear lots about this stuff and how to do that triaging. And then one thing that we find that's very important is we never want to go to the site twice. If the locator's out there, we have it strictly what he has to do as a checklist. And if he misses a step, okay, and he goes to complete that ticket, it shows that box in red and said, hey, you missed this question. You can't complete. And some of those things might be, is it a math discrepancy? Yes, no. Okay? So if I have yes, no, that means I can tell he has to put something. If I just had yes, like a checkbox, I don't know if he just missed it or he actually means no. So that's a little change, a little small thing, but it gives you an extra piece of data so you can actually track that. All right, the same as high profiles. A lot of times we couldn't believe center point was like, yeah, the locator just goes out there and if there's high profile, he just checks the box. And we're like, not doing that. So, you know, we're gonna identify it early and then have it be yes, no, make sure he answers every time. And if there's every time he says no and it says if there's a tag on it, then we're double checking those to make sure, right? And these are just data pieces that help us do uh, some different information. Right, and so if he's missed anything on that, we actually block him from completing it altogether. All right, um, one of the things uh, I wanted to do up here, is there any technology or anything out there that this conference that anyone has a question about or wants to discuss while we're in here? Any new piece, like what's going on in this industry? Or like in this area of it? I was at the Planet Underground and we talked about this as a round table and we had myself, a competitor of mine as well, two ticket management systems, you know, big shock. We also had a hardware manufacturer that was at the round table. And we had, um, I believe it was a, a general locator, right? And so, you know, that round table we had there talked about a lot of different things that we could do and talked about the mindset, what's available out there, what's not. But that's a constant process that all of you must do all the time. Right? It's exhausting, but you have to keep some sort of a finger, that, a finger on the pulse, and that's why we're at these conferences as well, to see what new things is coming out there, what do we want to do next, all right? There is uh, paper copies here for a survey, if you want to fill it out there on your phone as well, on the app, if you want to get the app. Um, it's a nice tool, and you can complete the survey on there. I think I have one other slide in here. All right, just some things to, to finish up on, I wanna talk about, it's really about this mindset, right? And how do, how do I gather this information? What do we wanna bring in next? I don't have all the money under the sun, I can't do it all. I have to pick choosingly, and that's what a cost-benefit analysis is. You're constantly evolving a cost-benefit analysis of how that um, affects your company, right? The technologies, it's, it's everywhere, and it's not just computers. I mean, if you look at the history of the located instruments, it's an interesting talk to see someone in 2023 still using the witch stick the odd time because, hey, that doesn't come up. So, you know, the technology that you have, it does not everything that does it all. You have to use your education, your experience, um, critically think, and play around and test around with the devices that you have out there, all right? Because like I said, there's no perfect solutions. And more and more, you see, like I said earlier, the IT background people are the ones that are moving into non-IT roles sometimes because more and more as we go through and grow with all this data that's around us, you know, people that understand the systems at a high level and how they connect move into positions of, of power, really, within their companies, all right? And we see, you see this everywhere, all right? Um, so, whether you're, you know, using existing technologies or, you know, pushing the limits on them or adopting new ones, I always want you to remember to, you know, work hard, work smart, critically think, look at these systems, uh, talk to your peers, network, look at the CGA white paper on the new tech things that are coming out, look at what you can do in-house yourself, um, 
and keep this mindset to help you guys, you know, leverage what's out there to help speed up your little case. There's no one solution for it all, it's a collection of them all. So I hope this, uh, you guys enjoy this talk a little bit and thank you.